Hi everybody, Richard Trowman here again at Artificial Lawyer TV. Uh, today we're doing another product walkthrough. This time it's with Patent Pal or Patent Pal, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. Um, with us to tell us more about it is Jack Zhu. Hi, Jack. Hi, Richard. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. And as you can see from the screen, this is a generative AI uh, product. It's not using specifically GPT-3, but it's using something similar. Uh, and Jack can tell you a lot more about that in a moment. Um, Jack, just tell us very briefly about yourself and how Patent Pal or Patent Pal got started. Sure. Um, so I have a background in machine learning. Uh, I'm also a practicing patent attorney previously. Uh, so I started in patent litigation at Finding Case before switching over to patent prosecution at Kilpatrick Townsend in Silicon Valley. Uh, so I worked on a very wide variety of AI technologies. And uh, as part of my own practice, I did a lot of uh, the kind of writing that goes into a patent application and finding that there's a lot of great synergies between the kind of AI technologies that were being developed just over the last three to four years with transformers and large language models and what they can do for my own practice. Uh, and so that was the inspiration for me in starting Patent Pal. Uh, so Patent Pal, uh, we use transformers and large language models in a very specific way. So, you know, uh, in the kind of mainstream media, you've seen GPT-3, you've seen Dali generate images, generate text, uh, and really kind of leveraging the wisdom of the crowd uh, to, uh, to provide a horizontal a solution to a wide variety of language tasks. Like it's really great for generating marketing copy, for sales copy. Um, so a lot of our work has been adapting the large language models uh, to use it in a very specific way to generate legal writing. Uh, and right now we're able to do a lot of it. So we automate about 50% of a provisional patent and we automate about 20 to 30% of a non-provisional full utility patent application. Gotcha. Well, uh, I don't understand fully, <laughs> but we will see more when you say automate. Um, we're, but I, I, I will I will let you explain the parts uh, where the automation part of this comes from. So I will disappear and I'll let you um, explain everything. Take it away. Awesome. Um, so if you arrive at our landing page at townpal.com, uh, you can create an account with us. Uh, once you log in, uh, and I'm going to log in here with my account, uh, you'll get uh, to this page here, which is kind of how you would get started. So you can either drag and drop a Word document right into the browser, uh, or you can click on upload Word document. Uh, in this case, we're just going to start with a blank document. Um, so uh, the input into the software is a set of claims. So here I'm going to uh, use an example from a published patent application. There are 33 claims in this example. Uh, and once you put your claims in, you just click on this red button off to the right. What the software does is essentially try to understand what is the invention that the patent claims are describing. Uh, an invention from a computational perspective is essentially a knowledge graph. It's an arrangement of technical concepts. Uh, and so what the tool does is extract all, out all of the concepts in the claims, all of the relationships connecting the concept, and it builds that underlying knowledge graph. Uh, and then it uses that knowledge graph to then generate these figures and specification language that I use to write uh, manually in my own practice. Um, so essentially uh, machine learning is used at a very low level to be able to solve probabilistic language tasks. And when you get to higher levels of language, uh, it gets more and more symbolic. So as pattern attorneys, we all know uh, it's uh, the kind of mechanical writing that goes into writing many sections of the patent application. Uh, and so it's about creating a solution that uh, leverages machine learning for these low-level tasks, but uh, allows the user to then work uh, predictably uh, using their domain expertise at a high level to generate this kind of language. Uh, so I think the first question uh, for, for anyone who is a patent attorney, the uh, kind of first question is like, what parts of the patent do we generate? We generate the abstract section of a patent. We generate the brief summary. Uh, for anything that's a method claim, we generate flowcharts. And for anything that's um, not time-based, but state-driven, uh, so anything that's a system, we generate a block diagram. So uh, it's an abstract conceptual diagram uh, that shows the containment hierarchy of these kind of concepts. Um, so altogether, what this is achieving uh, for the purposes of the patent is providing that claim support language under Section 112 in the U.S. And there's equivalent regulations in the uh, EU as well. 
Uh, and so what claim support means is just that whatever that you're trying to claim as your intellectual property must be supported in the specification. Um, otherwise, you will get a rejection from the patent office uh, saying that you're trying to claim too much IP that you haven't yet disclosed and shared with the world. Um, and so these kind of rejections are very problematic because it would either block prosecution because you cannot uh, add new subject matter after filing a patent, or it can delay patent prosecution because you have to explain to an examiner at the patent office why they're wrong, why you know this particular element like a motor is in fact recited in a specification even uh, e even if it's not literally cited, at least by equivalency. And this is just kind of the kind of conversation that a practitioner, a patent attorney would want to try to avoid. Um, and so in practice, what we do is we write this kind of mechanical language uh, in the brief summary and in the detailed description to make sure there is, in fact, you know, at least narrow and literal claim support. Uh, so in the brief summary, we provide support for each individual claim element. And then in the detailed description, we provide support for this arrangement of claim elements as the as recited in the claims. And we do that in combination with the figures we generate as well. Um, to kind of just show how this tool works uh, using a much simpler example, uh, I'm just gonna write a simple claim here. So an analogy is like this tool is like a compiler that treats the claims like a pseudo programming language, right? It's a kind of a software analogy here. Uh, so if I just write like a computer, it's going to generate one block with the computer in it. In the detailed description, it will say figure one is a block diagram that describes a computer according to embodiments. Uh, and then what I can do is to continue drafting this claim element by element and build on top of that. So I can say a computer comprising a processor, you know, um, a memory device, uh, wherein the device includes a module, right, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it does a really great job with handling imperfect inputs, like in proper claim drafting, you want to put in the semicolons. Uh, in this case, it recognizes that the device refers to the memory device, even though it's not a literal match. Uh, so you can give it something like a first memory device uh, and a second, you know, second memory device. Uh, and by default, it's going to recognize this refers to the most recent concept, second memory device. Uh, and then if you give it the full proper antecedent basis, uh, it's going to identify the global match as well. And in the detailed description, will provide that non-limiting prose language that will provide support for that claim. So it will say the first memory device may include a module. Uh, we reconstruct a sentence. We change the verb to permissive tense, right? And essentially automates, you know, the kind of mechanical writing that otherwise needs to be done manually. Cool. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of like how this demo works, how this tool works at a high level. Um, I'll show you an example of a flow chart as well. So anything that has a time dimension will generate a flow chart like this. Uh, and then the language in the detailed description will be fairly predictable to the user as well. It'll say figures one to uh, one A to one B are flow charts describing a method uh, for capturing body motion according to embodiments. Uh, in some embodiments of 102, the method may include, you know, a first step, 104 may include a second step. Um, all of these phrases are also fully customizable. Uh, so if you wanted to say, you know, other types of word choices or phrase choices, you can customize that. So examples, you know, say may also include or can also include, uh, and all of this is updated in real time, uh, essentially with one action. Um, so that's kind of how this tool works. Uh, did you have any questions, Richard? Yeah, well, first of all, it's really fascinating. It, it's, a, it's good to see uh, genuinely practical uh, use case in the legal world uh, for generative AI. Uh, I've got, well, quite a few questions, but so, I mean, just looking at what you've provided there, I mean, fundamentally, it's not, you might say, being truly generative in the sense that it's it's working from just two or three prompts. You, you are building a lot of the input language yourself. What it's doing is building the figures and then it's building, you might say, sort of like uh, long form, properly written out description. That that's what it's doing for you. Yeah, it's not um, kind of gen like hallucinating a lot of new language. It's not yeah. currently adding new subject matter. Uh, you know the the challenge with using GP three for that purpose is that um, it, it could say a lot of things that you didn't want this you know application to say, right? 
Uh, and so it's about figuring out like what is the exact use case? What do lawyers actually write in a patent application? And how can we build a tool that does exactly that? Uh, and that's what this tool does right now. Uh, but certain sections of the patent would be more amenable to, I think, what you're saying in terms of, I guess you use the term truly generative uh, in terms of any tool that generates new subject matter using prior knowledge would be something like the background section for like describing prior art, for example, right? Gotcha, gotcha. Well, and, and of course, it makes sense. You don't want, if you're making a patent application, you don't want a system to just be making stuff up uh, because it can. Um, let's just talk about the GPT-3 and the, the overall language model that you're using. So this isn't GPT-3. This is a different language model. Is it one that you built yourself? or? It, and I guess another no. fact, factor connected to that is privacy. Obviously, you don't want all this information being uploaded to a unknown third party. I mean, can you just explain yeah. what your model is and how you deal with the data? Yeah, it's a large language model. It's a transformer. It's similar to GPT-3, but not specific to GPT-3. Um, you know, we train the model on general language corpuses, large language corpuses, uh, and then we fine tune it on all of the published patent application data. Um, currently, we, we don't store any of the user content. Right, so like your inputs, uh, the claims, and then your the generated outputs, none of that is stored on our servers. It is processed uh, temporarily in memory with AWS. Um, that's just how computers work. Uh, in order to process this data, it needs to be at least stored in memory temporarily. But we don't have any kind of long term storage, as you know. Uh, so I wouldn't have access to any of the data that goes through our tool, for example. Got you, got you. So just to clarify, so this model you effectively built yourself, um, even though you're using public data, some of the public data is, is just highly relevant, specialized data that's relevant to patents. Uh, no, it's the third party model that we've taken is an open source model uh, that we've adapted and we've fine tuned um, published patent applications. Got, oh, I see, got you. And wh which is the open source model you're using? Well, we're using transformers from Spacey. So can you say that again? Spacey. Spacey. Uh, Spacey is like a hugging face competitor. Yeah. Ah, right. Okay. Got you. Got you. Got you. So that's like you might say your vanilla model, and then you you've sort of like specialized it with your with your own training. Yeah, that's right. Got you. Fantastic. Um, just last couple of questions. So where have you got to now? I mean, is the product ready to go? If I was a patent lawyer and I saw this and I went, great, I want it. Can can people use it? Would you encourage people to just go out and get it now? Or where are you now? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's very much in production. This tool is out there. People are using it. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have many major customers that we're working with right now, both in-house teams and outside firms. Um, and yeah, uh, like just to give offer some benchmarks, like um, the first patent help patent uh, that was filed uh, during what we first launched the product beginning of this year, we had a beta before that. So we had a patent that was filed during our beta in December of last year. Uh, and that patent has already been approved and issued by the US Patent Office uh, as of two months ago in September. And that, that, that's a patent for Patent Pal? Or, or a uh, that's what, that was a, used it. Uh, no, for a client, uh, for a customer. So it was patent that was written with the assistance of our technology. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, no, it makes sense. And, and what, what, on, that, on that same question, have you patented uh, what you're doing? Uh, well, we, we are working on that ourselves as well. So uh, yeah, we, we do have a portfolio incoming. Uh, right now, a lot of uh, what we have is also trade secret. Yeah. Oh, no, of course, of course, of course. No, very, 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 very interesting. Well, look, thanks very much, Jack. Um, it's really, like I said, really good to see uh, a generative AI uh, product that's uh, very, very, very applicable to the legal sector and doing uh, realistic work. So thank you very much for that. Thanks very much, Richard.